Hello and welcome to a foreign policy virtual dialogue exploring how to renew trust in elections, the very bedrock of democracy. I'm Ravi Agrawal, FP's Editor-in-Chief, and it's my pleasure to be your host this morning. Mistrust of election results is not just an American problem, it's a global trend. The question is how to fix it. A lack of trust is becoming a defining element of global elections. You don't like the result, just say it's rigged. Call the system into question. Call it into question enough times and people might believe you. All of this is damaging to both democratic institutions and social cohesion, whether spurred by historical divisions or deliberately fueled by political actors seeking to capitalize on instability, even the most technically sound electoral process can be overshadowed when mistrust takes root. Public trust is hard won, easily lost, and very difficult to restore. Now, while every election and electoral system has its flaws, electoral integrity must be strengthened to legitimately reflect the will of the voters and for election results to be accepted by electorates. How do we do this? We always like answers. So we have some great experts joining us today who have thought a lot about this issue and who've spent their working lives protecting elections and thinking about safeguarding democracy. If you care about these issues, you will want to hear their take. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks to IFAS, the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, for helping us make this event possible. We'll bring in our guests in just a minute. But before that, I just want to make sure we can hear from you, our audience, as well. We've got many hundreds of people tuning in, as well as watching our live stream streams on social media. If you're in Zoom and you want to participate, click on the Q&A button below, submit your name and questions. Uh, I'd be happy to take some of your questions over the course uh, of this event. If you'd like to email us, the, uh, the address is events at foreignpolicy.com. Of course, chime in on social media. Use the hashtag trusted results. So let's get started. My first guest is no stranger to responding to the tactic of undermining the results of an election. Chris Krabs served as the first director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at CISA that was created by Congress to ensure that foreign and domestic actors do not interfere in U.S. election results. He was then fired by President Trump in November 2020 by tweet for not agreeing with his claim about election tampering in the 2020 presidential election. Krebs is now the founding partner at Krebs Stamos Group and chair of the Commission on Information Disorder at the Aspen Institute. Chris, welcome. Hey, Robbie, thanks for having me today. Yeah, great to have you on. Um, you know, let's just start with this. I mean, you obviously speak widely about what happened uh, in the 2020 elections. Um, just quickly, give us a lay of the land of your role at the time in sort of confirming the results uh, of the 2020 elections and the challenges you faced? Well, the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency was established uh, by statute, by legislation, uh, the US Congress in 2018, to be the nation's uh, lead civilian cyber defense agency to work with partners in the private sector and state and local government to help protect our nation's critical infrastructure. And in critical infrastructure is everything from the water that comes out of your tap uh, to the, the energy that keeps your lights on to the bank where you keep your money. But, but in recent years, it's been expanded to include government services as well as the administration of elections. And I think 2016, the Russian interference with the 2016 election caught most by surprise. And I've kind of likened it to a almost Sputnik moment where uh, you know it was, it was a shock to the system here in the US where cyber and disinformation could be used to attack and undermine our, our institutions, our public institutions, including elections. And so from 2017 to th 2020, uh, in my role as the director of CISA, worked with state and local partners to help protect their systems, to increase the cybersecurity, to increase the physical security, and to work with them to build uh, the resilience of those systems. And so as it came around to the summer of 2020, and the fall of 2020, during the course of the 2020 presidential election, we were working with uh, our partners in the election community that, that are in the US administered at the state and local level to understand some of the themes that were emerging that were attacking trust on elections. And these are things like uh, uh, 
you know, satellites, Italian satellites being used to change votes, uh, mm -hmm. thermostats, uh, Sharpies, markers, they would bleed through ballots. Some were intentional, some were unintentional. But what we would do is we would actually prop promulgate and share the defense in depth measures, the security mm -hmm. measures, the resilience measures that were in place across uh, the, the United States to protect elections. And ultimately, uh, after the election, and, and I think ultimately what got me fired, was saying, in fact, that this was a secure election. And it was. It was the most litigated. It was the most scrutinized. It was the most audited. It had the most paper ballots associated with votes. And I stand by that to this day. And uh, despite the, the continuing churn of disinformation around the 2020 election. So let me ask you a question that might, on the face of it, sound silly. You say that this election was completely secure, um, especially from your vantage point as a cybersecurity expert. Um, and yet questions were raised. What, what happened? Why was it so difficult to dispel the questions that were raised? Why was it so difficult to, why did this become a big debate? Well, look, it, it's not just me that was saying these things. We had the then Attorney General uh, Barr saying that, that there was no sort of fraud or other sort of activity, nefarious activity that would compromise or change votes uh, to, to tilt the election. You've seen there was, you know, 60, 70 plus lawsuits after the election uh, that, that were all resolved in favor of, uh, you know, the existing outcomes of the election it went through the certification process. But the advantage that the disinformation peddlers, the influence merchants, so to speak, have is asymmetry. They, they can flood the zone. They're not trying to convince you of any one single fact. Instead, what they're trying to do is confuse you and lose kind of your North Star of what the facts are and what the truth is. And, and when you become confused and you don't, you can't really see through the haze, then you become untethered and you're more, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're more susceptible to continued lies. And we continue to see this, the, the narrative continues to shift. There was almost an AB test that happened in 2020 where the initial claims of, uh, of election interference were about uh, foreign threats, the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese. But mm -hmm. as time progressed through December of 2020 and into January 21 and even to today, we, we saw that those foreign interference and those technical compromise measures, uh, they were hard to follow. They were hard to understand. And, and e whether it was the influence merchants or the audience, they couldn't really latch onto it. Instead, they went back to the old ways, the talking about fraud and tribalism, and it was the Democrats, and you're dehumanizing, and you're just playing on the old tropes uh, that include some aspects of race and just historical divisions uh, mm -hmm. in the United States. In the months leading up to the actual election of November 2020, um, in hindsight now, uh, were you surprised by, by the, the ferocity of the claims that were made by the extent to which this became a, a public sort of messy discussion? You know, I think, I think to a certain extent we underreacted. I think to this day we're still underreacting in part to what happened kind of behind the scenes with the slate of electors, of alternate ele electors, uh, the events of January 6th. I think a lot of these mechanisms and at least the narratives and the framework or infrastructure for the Stop the Steal movement was in fact in place in 2016 and had the former president lost then, he could have activated that same sort of mechanism. Uh, but my greatest concern is not so much what has happened, uh, you, you know, what happened in the summer of 2020, but where we are now and that the incentive structures in the far right wing of the Republican Party actually uh, lean in favor of election deniers. You look at some research by 538 that says one third of Republican candidates are election deniers. You have you have you know, candidates for uh, governor and secretary of state that say they would both decertify the 2020 election and going forward, they they very possibly would not certify a, uh, a Democratic win in 24 for president if it came out that way. So I think the incentive structures have shifted as well as the permission structures that are going to lead, uh, unfortunately, I think, to more political violence along the lines of January 6th. Right. And, and this strikes me as sort of a burn down the system kind of approach, because obviously you could you could deny that the 2020 election was legitimate, but then, you know, that also calls into question elections in the future. And were you to even win under those circumstances, then, you know, you, you've destroyed the playbook, you've destroyed the system. Um, what is your sense of how to build 
some semblance of trust because clearly as you point out there are a lot of candidates who can deny that you know the current administration is legitimate um yet run for election there's clearly a constituency in america a large fairly large constituency right. of voters of people um who openly call into question um dispute the things you have said um when you were in the administration um how do you begin to deal with that well i you know i think there are some steps we need to take from a strategic perspective i think one of the main challenges we have is the accountability measures actually don't really exist right now. The, the only reason, the only, one of the only f- ways you can hold an elective of, official accountable here in the United States is at the ballot box. And so we do need people to get out and say, you know what, we are not going to reward you for continuing to punish or, or rather uh, push these, these narratives. There are some more exquisite measures in the constitution. We saw a county commissioner in the state of New Mexico uh, be pulled off the ballot for participating in the insurrection. He was actually declared constitutionally ineligible to hold office. Uh, you know, I think that is a, an extreme step, but one that should be continued to explore. But again, it goes back to that piece about people getting out there and holding elected officials accountable. At the same time, leaders need to lead. We need Republicans that are committed to constitution, to the Constitution and the peaceful transfer of power and faith in our elections to stand up and call these people out. Look at what Liz Cheney has done, what Adam Kinzinger has done. We're seeing this slowly start to reemerge from uh, the Republican Party. I mean, we saw uh, Dan Crenshaw from Texas say something about this the other day. We need more people to step up and say, no, that's that's not true. Now, there are risks here. They may not loot win their election, right? That the, the base may turn out and say, you know what? We don't want you anymore because you're not continuing to push these lies. So so there is risk here. And that but has we, been happening. I mean, we've had candidates choose not to run. We've had candidates lose. I, absolutely. And I think this gets back to kind of one of the core elements. Why are people going into politics? Is it for power or is it for actually doing right by the country and by the Constitution? We need more people to step up and say, look, I'm going to lose. I may lose. I don't know. But what's more important is the country rather than the party and being in power and having access to the halls of power. Because we need good faith actors on both sides of the aisle in order for democracy to continue. And we really have to get past that acceptance and that permission structure shift where it's like, oh, it's okay. They're just saying that they don't mean it. They're just saying it to get election elected. Well, there are two sides of risk here. They may actually mean what they say. And the other is they're continuing to condition voters to accept that this is in fact appropriate, acceptable behavior. And then, you know, in, the, in the United States, let me ask you this, like, given how, how much you've studied this, both in and out of the administration, um, if you were to sort of um, gauge, you know, what, what percentage of the threats to, you know, elections in America is domestic versus foreign, what's your sense of that ratio? Well, I, I think this is the, the right question at this time in the run up to 22, as I've been asked, you know, countless times recently, you know, what's the foreign interference threat? What are the Russians thinking? What are the Chinese thinking? Look, they don't actually have to do that much work. We're tearing ourselves apart internally. Uh, and, and, you know, as it goes anyway, from a disinformation perspective, we don't see a lot of organic narrative or thematic development from adversaries. What they're doing is latching on to existing narratives. Facebook, in fact, just uh, talked about a uh, campaign they tore down from Chinese actors they were taking both sides of an issue. The Russians did the same thing in 2016. So I think the majority of the risk, it's not so much the threats, but the risk to US elections is in fact democracy, again, or, or domestic rather. We are attacking ourselves. We're giving space for adversaries to come in and pour kerosene uh, or fuel on a fire, so to speak. And what we need to do is actually get back to the basics here and realize that democracy takes effort. Look. Autocracy, authoritarian governments are easy. You have faith in somebody that's going to do the thing for you, and you can just sit back. Democracy takes work. It takes leadership. It takes community involvement. It takes understanding of how the system and process works. And we've kind of untethered a lot of that. Civics education is not a thing that we teach in K through 12, uh, at least enough these days. Mm -hmm. And we also need to get back to our community roots here in the U.S. and understand that, that all politics are local. And we're being attacked at the local level 
by uh, far right activists. You look at what's happening in South Florida with Proud Boys and Oath Keepers actually uh, moving into leadership ranks in local politics. Um, you know, just as you uh, sort of analyze the state of play in America and how easily it can be exploited by, by foreign actors, but also domestic actors, um, do you see those same sort of seeds of mistrust being sown in other countries around the world? A absolutely. I've, uh, over the last year and a half or so, have consulted with a number of different uh, governments from Australia, Germany, France, that have all gone through elections, uh, the UK, of course. Uh, it, it, what is happening is this, the information space is creating a lot of opportunity, both for grifters, and there's a significant amount of financial gain that is happening in the, the disinformation and mistrust creating community. There's influence on platforms, there's money that's being raised, there are you know, merchandise, books, other things being sold, all as a part of a grift. But there's also political uh, opportunism that's happening, and it's being in part fed or, or you know, happening across uh, the internet, and social media platforms, in alternative forms of uh, information. Look, I am Can all. Can I push for... you on the the social yeah. media uh, front? Sure. Actually, um, you, you know, I interviewed Nick Clegg of Meta last week and asked him about this. But do you think um, social media platforms are doing anywhere near enough to prevent? Um, the, the, this kind of exploitation of, of, of people's, uh, of what they see and how they engage? So I, look, I've got good friends that work at Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere, elsewhere. And some of those relationships I've developed over the last five years as a part of defending democracy here in the U.S. So compared to 2016, they're light years beyond where they were in, towards, in terms of their platforms being targeted by information actors. But look, I mean, there's a scale challenge here. There's a linguistic challenge here. Uh, machine learning and AI and humans right now are, I don't think are fully up to the task. And so we continue to have to invest. They, they need to continue investing in their capabilities to detect uproot and not let their platforms be abused by uh, you know, actors that are, that are contrary to, to democracy. And, and as a result, we are in fact seeing digital authoritarianism rise globally. And it's not just happening in Russia and in China. It is spreading and actors, uh, you know, authoritarian actors, autocratic actors are, are leveraging these platforms to get their messages out there. Yeah, I can imagine. And we see it in sort of the creation of splinter nets uh, around the world as well. I'm going to bring in a couple of uh, questions from our viewers around the world um, and I'll try and pose two of them to you together. Um, the first is from Marianne Erickson um, in the UK. She asks if you think that the US responded to the rise of fascism globally, or do you think the US has led the charge uh, on the rise of fascism that we're seeing? As you mull that question, uh, another one from Khalil Ahmed, um, elections are part of politics, but can we remove the politics from elections so that it becomes a moral or legal institution on its own. Slightly philosophical, um, your take on either of those or both. Well, I, you know, I, I do think that uh, the, the foreign policy of the last administration had some impact on, in terms of disrupting multinational groups, you know, the, the constant threats to NATO. Fortunately, NATO was able to withstand, uh, but they came out the other end, I do think, uh, at least recently with, with more investment, they were able to push back, have been able to push back, I think, effectively against uh, Russia moving into Ukraine and providing uh, particular support to Ukraine. Um, I, you know, similarly, I think in, uh, in, in the Pacific, we've seen support of uh, you know, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, Australia, and elsewhere. So I, you know, I, I think from a fascism growing globally, uh, it, you know, whether the U.S. has, I think, perhaps created some opportunity space for fascism to grow. And I think we need to get back to kind of, again, the roots of uh, allowing democracy to flourish uh, through through international engagement and multinational form. As for, you know, po taking the politics out of elections, I'm not really sure, at least in the U.S., how that would would work. I, I know that there are some conversations about should the roles that administer elections like secretaries of state, should those be nonpartisan positions mm -hmm. rather than statewide elections? I think that's worth considering. I think it's worth making sure that, you know, you're not worried about a Republican or a Democrat that's running your election. In fact, it should be uh, 
a bipartisan, but ultimately, you know, people themselves are political and they have political views. So it, yeah. it could be hard in the longer term to divorce those two. Yeah, I would imagine, uh, uh, you know, since I have you here and given given your expertise, I, I have to ask you um, a question related to the Russia um, Ukraine war right now. Um, it's striking to me that we haven't seen major U.S. a major Russian cyber attacks yet uh, on on America, or maybe there have been and they've been repelled. Um, does it strike you that we maybe overestimated Russia's offensive cyber capabilities, um, or are they just holding back? I, this is the the question that there will be you know thousands of papers at think tanks and war colleges written in the next decade. You know, did we overestimate? Did they withhold? If they held back, why? Look, I think the reality is that the Russians launched a number of cyber attacks on Ukraine in the early days of the wars, destructive attacks, probably on the order of what had previously happened in a decade in a span of a couple months. In, in Ukraine, over the last, since 2014 at least, has really built up their resilience to such attacks. And I think they've performed quite admirably. It's worth noting, though, that probably the most visible attack that the Russians conducted was against a satellite internet or telecommunications company mm -hmm. called Viasat. And it disrupted some of the ground-based systems, the modems that route and, and handle traffic. And, and as a result, you know, Ukrainian operations of government and infrastructure were affected. The interesting part is that Viasat is in fact a US company. And mm -hmm. so there were US interests that were attacked. Now that was a, uh, a recent acquisition, as I understand it, of Viasat, but nonetheless, an American entity or company was, was affected here. My greatest concern is going forward. We look at what's happening with Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. There are rumors of targeting against uh, liquid natural gas or liquefied natural gas going into Europe right now. I think this is the time that, that we should all be thinking very uh, deeply about when, when Putin doesn't have good options left to, them, to him and he only, only has bad options left, how might he use them? And I think we are getting into a very, uh, you know, for me, a very concerning phase, at least globally, of, mm -hmm. of this conflict in Ukraine, where it could see an escalation. You know, you've heard plenty of talk about the nuclear threat. And I'm seeing, I'm thinking through more of a disruption to global uh, industry and telecommunications and the digital ecosystem, uh, in part purely because we are so dependent upon uh, digital technologies right now, and that will only increase going forward. Yeah, it's an issue we think about a lot here as well. Chris Krebs, thank you very much. Great to have you on. Thank you, Robbie. Our Chris Krebs there, um, the former head of CISA. Um, we, uh, it was great to take some viewer questions. Uh, remember, if um, you'd like to chime in or you have a question you'd like me to pose to our next few guests, um, write in. Um, we have a team uh, selecting questions and passing them on to me, and I'd be happy to take in uh, a few more uh, and shape our conversation. Um, everything we've been discussing so far, um, mostly American, um, is all a terrific segue um, to our next uh, panel conversation where we're going to dive deeper into the data around election mistrust. So I'm going to bring in my next three guests. We've got Mavemba Fezo Desolele. Uh, he is a senior fellow and director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Movember served as the course coordinator for Central and Southern Africa at the U.S. Foreign Service Institute, also as an election monitor uh, and delegate in several countries, including Nigeria, Ethiopia, and the DRC. Dr. Cassandra Emmons is a democracy data analyst for IFAS. Uh, she is responsible for developing their data analytics and visualization capabilities to ensure that we have evidence-based approaches uh, in all of IFAS's programming. And Dr. Rachel Kleinfeld is a senior fellow of Democracy, Conflict, and Governance. Uh, that's the Democracy, Conflict, and Governance program uh, at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She spent her career advising governments, philanthropists, and activists on how democracies make major social change. Um, she's focused on troubled democracies, uh, including the US, but also um, other countries. Welcome, all of you. Great to see you all. Great to have you on. Uh, Movember, I'll start with you, if that's okay. Um, uh, you've you've been doing a lot of work on um, elections across Africa. Um, of course, we have the Kenyan elections this year um, coming up. There are other elections that I know you and many of us will have our eyes on. 
give us a bigger picture view of um, the broader sort of issue of trust um, in, in, in elections across the African continent. Um, does it strike you that, that people there tend to believe that elections are free and fair? Thank you, Ravi. Uh, thank you for having me. The, um, you know, when we talk about trust and what people think about the result, it's really about the process. Do people have trust in the process? By the time we get to the election result, that's too late. In other words, how does a country choose its commissioners on the electoral independent commission? How are they selected? In a lot of these countries, there is a lot of contention on who get to sit on the electoral commission. Then there is an issue of how do you select the uh, people get the contract? Then the issues of the narrative. Then the issues of the independence of the media. Then you add on technology. So if you were, if there was a contentious process in selecting the commissioners, that leaves a bad taste in the mouth mm -hmm. of the electors, so to speak, or the voters. Then if the, there was a lot of opacity on how contracts came about, and in this case, I'm talking about where did you order your ballots from? who got what kind of contract in terms of getting the cars and so on, then how did you inform the population or the voters on where they, they will be voting? In many countries, people don't know exactly where they'll be voting until several months before that, or sometime a couple of weeks before the time. So did you publish the list on time? And then the other one is technology. If technology does not work, in other words, if there are too many glitches in the technology that you're putting in place, this can become a serious problem. So if we look at Nigeria, for instance, in 2019, Nigeria had introduced this uh, electronic uh, system with the voter ID. A lot of times that didn't work. So all the misfire just add to the problem. If you look at Kenya, I was in Kenya just like a month ago. It's interesting because people were so worried about Kenya and what will happen and what will go wrong. One thing that we noticed that was a calming factor is the process itself worked. Mm. So there were very few problems with the machines, what they call the Kim's kit. The mm. machines seem to work well, and that goes a long way in asserting the trust into the system, into mm. the result. So by the time the result came out, whether it's in Nigeria or in Kenya, the process, or it already established how people will feel about that result. Mm. Cassandra, let me bring you in here. Um, bigger picture, do, do you get the sense, um, given your work, given what you study, when you look around the world, do you get the sense that over the last decade, globally, people have less faith in elections? Uh, unfortunately, simple answer is yes. Um, we've been seeing this in a lot of very objective measures. Um, and I, part of it, it goes to exactly what was just described, all the nuance of the actual process of an election. Um, but we actually think that there are more layers to that that contribute towards that mistrust. Um, and hopefully can contribute towards an increase in trust if we can identify them properly. Um, but to your question first, you know, for the past 16 years, we've seen objective measures such as the varieties of democracy data set that have tracked the quality of democracy around the world is declining. Mm -hmm. So you have a 16 year trend in that. And then in parallel, you have a, a conversation about whether people still believe in the democratic process, still believe that democracy works for them. There are, again, objective measures showing that it does, but do people actually hold that belief? And unfortunately, we've seen in other uh, data collection efforts, dissatisfaction with electoral democracy is at an all-time high. And this was before uh, COVID, actually, even. So, and by all accounts, that further contributed to this decline in trust in government and decline in trust in elections. Um, and, and elections are a very tangible way that people experience democracy, right? Mm -hmm. So that is often um, a 
stand in for the way that people think about democracy as a whole is what they think about their election process. So mm -hmm. in addition to the procedure, though, when you look at the entire electoral process, um, you have trust in individuals. So trust in individual leaders, individual political candidates, trust in individual parties. Uh, and then you also have the institutions, which kind of fit into the procedural element that was just described, um, but also can just be a general trust people may hold that these institutions have worked for us, they've mm. delivered for us, and we can continue to trust the results if their stamp of approval is on it. Um, so sometimes you have these three types of trust, personal, procedural, and institutional, that are all working well. Sometimes you have pieces of it, more often than not, you'll have pieces of it that won't quite um, be, be, won't be that strong. So maybe we have low procedural trust in one place, but there may be candidates in that particular election that we have high faith in. Um, and so that might be a way that we can still uh, encourage, um, excuse me, I'm coughing a little bit. <laughs> we can still right. encourage uh, trust in the actual outcome. Right, right. All right. Rachel, let me bring you in uh, as well here. Um, you know, political violence um, often goes hand in hand um, with mistrust in elections, um, with outcomes that people don't buy into. Um, tell us a little bit more about the relationship between those two. Absolutely. So as the previous uh, speakers have said, what we've been seeing over the last 20 years is an increase in political violence around elections. So about one in five elections worldwide now feature a fatality um, of some civilian or more. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about once a month. So this is going up. Um, and when people believe, whether it's true or false, that an election was stolen, it tends to instigate political unrest. But that unrest doesn't have to be violent. It can be peaceful protests. What tends to turn things violent is leadership. And I think we really need to return some agency to this discussion because how people interpret what is happening within their elections, how people interpret the types of contractual issues and so on that we were hearing about, that has everything to do with the leadership of political parties and political candidates. And it's why in America it was so disturbing that right after the election, mm -hmm. you saw a candidate sort of turn um, on the election itself. One other thing that we know is that um, simply making the infrastructure of elections stronger won't actually rebuild trust if there's candidates actively trying to right. sow distrust, that the, um, the election can never be perfect and it can never be strong enough to overcome that sowing of distrust by um, leaders. In fact, when you try to make it stronger as happened in America uh, prior to 2020, some of the money goes to some places first. It's just inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, some of the infrastructure gets built up a little bit more and people will say, oh, you know, that was actually a changing of voting machines that should cause more distrust rather mm -hmm. than the opposite or those places are being helped. We saw that in Afghanistan, um, the attempt to sort of buy hearts and minds um, through infrastructure and we see it in America. So getting at this issue of trust is much deeper than just mm -hmm. make the elections work well. It really has to do with how leaders are shaping public beliefs and why they're shaping public beliefs to build on distrust rather than building greater trust. Right, indeed. I mean, it's hard to fix a system when figureheads of the system uh, call the system into question. Um, Movemba, let me bring you back in. I, I want to sort of also bring in some of our questions from viewers, and I want to begin now to move us towards um, solutions. Um, we all, in all of our jobs, spend a lot of time, you know, outlining the problems, but but from here on, let's try and think about ways in which um, institutions and governments can build more trust um, in electoral processes and therefore in democracy. Um, November, um, we have a question from uh, Moses Clark in Monrovia, Liberia, and his question is, how can we empower election experts to strengthen integrity in African elections? Uh, good question. I think to empower, in, in many ways, election experts already have the power. Right? The question is, how do you mobilize those who bring the, the laws of the country and implement them to do it? One way to do it is just the population to put pressure on their own leaders. Um, that typically works better uh, because there is an organic engagement 
that then put pressure on the system. Mm -hmm. The other way is to bring in the international community and often the international community can play a positive role if they can do this on a true prong approach. Mm -hmm. One is of course the messaging itself that the public sees. The other one is what happens behind closed doors. So in a place like Zambia, uh, which has been a success story uh, of the recent elections in, uh, in Africa, uh, the stakeholders, the local, the youth particularly, were very engaged in putting pressure on the system, meaning by system, I mean the leadership of that country, that they will not stand for anything that is less than acceptable. Mm. But there, then also the second layer was that donor countries of which you know, um, Zambia was very in need of, uh, they rely on, on foreign aid and so on. Those countries, the UK, the US and others, you know, close hands and push pressure, both mm -hmm. publicly, but mostly very robust diplomacy behind closed mm -hmm. doors. So that's create the room for partnerships between organizations like IFS, NDI, I mean, the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, the National Democratic, uh, uh, the National Democratic Institute, the International Republican, to name but a few, the bunch of these organizations around the world, for them to come and work in partnerships mm. with the local experts and move that process for it's not enough, like Rachel said, it's much more complicated than this. But at least on that level of the architecture, the electoral actual architecture itself, that can move it forward and allow for the electoral experts to do their work at least. Mm. Too. Awesome. You know, I, I always love taking uh, questions from audiences when we do these events, but on this topic in particular, I think, which is about building trust, there's something particularly nice about taking uh, questions from viewers who are, you know, frankly, all over the world. Um, so in that spirit, um, I'm going to I'm going to bring up a couple of questions. Uh, Cassandra, Rachel, uh, you may or may not have an answer to this, and it's fine if you don't, but I'm going to raise them anyway. Um, Michael Atkins asks if any of you have data on countries conducting audits on the accuracy of the results from an election. Um, in South Africa, for example, he says a partial analysis um, of numerical results shows a noticeable rate of errors. So just a general question of whether um, uh, there's data on audits. Um, and another one from Mohammed Abdallah who asks, if voter turnout is very low, can the results of an election be trusted? Um, which is, I guess, um, difficult to define what is low. There's uh, obviously raw numbers. There's also comparative numbers. Uh, Italy, for example, had elections um, just over the weekend, which was, you know, had record low turnout, but it was still 64% turnout. Much just happened to be much lower than in recent years. Um, Cassandra or Rachel, either of you, do I see a hand coming up? Cassandra, can I come to you? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we actually have a, a guide on risk limiting audits that I would, would point um, the questioner, I apologize if I get his name too. Um, but these have been, as Chris also described earlier, these have been used in more and more elections. So there's a number of different ways these can be conducted. Um, and yeah, that data does exist and getting data uh, transparent, making data transparently available is one way to really try to bolster trust in election processes and in election results. Um, yeah. So, can I, so can I ask you, um, just staying with you, Cassandra, I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you a hypothetical, which is actually a, a real live issue. So in Brazil, um, forthcoming elections, we have um, an incumbent leader who has you know, um, suggested quite clearly that were he to lose, he may call into question um, the results of the election or the veracity of the election. Um, that's a real live scenario that we're all facing right now. Um, you know, again, from, from your work in academia, from what you see, like what are the ways in which um, election monitors in Brazil, um, democracy activists, how do you build trust uh, in a result um, that, you know, may not go the way an incumbent wants it to go. Yeah, I mean, this is an example of Brazil, but also other places of the past few years, we've seen this play out in different ways, um, where you can then fall on the process and being making 
very transparent the way that people are conducting um, conducting themselves, the way poll workers are um, opening themselves up to observers, um, things like that. You um, can also look to the institution itself in Brazil, which has undertaken over the past few years a lot of institutional reform in order to build their credibility with the, with the people. And so what we're going to see play out here is exactly this situation where you have the three different kinds of trust at varying levels. And is institutional and procedural going to be enough to counter what might be, um, unfortunately, a leader not leading um, by not accepting the results of a democratic process. We don't know that that would play out, but we've seen that other places. Um, and then it, it falls to the institutional or procedural levels of trust instead. Mm. Rachel, I'm going to bring you back in. Um, there's a great question, which I think is from one of our, our viewers right up your alley. It's Ian Michael Anthony, who's the chief elections officer in Dominica asking if there's any data on electoral conflicts and measures that actually work to resolve these conflicts. So um, the different types of conflicts, different types of violence have different causes. The, most election violence happens when an incumbent feels themselves threatened by um, a likely challenger who's likely to win. And they can use um, parts of the state to achieve uh, power and mastery through state violence, and um, that tends to trigger uh, a reaction. That kind of violence, which is the, the mass of election violence, is hard to counter from the state because the state is causing, uh, is instigating a great deal of the violence. We've seen um, in anti-democratic instances of countering that. In Bangladesh, for instance, you had a military takeover mm -hmm. and then a caretaker government that ran elections where they did things like said, no one can drive on election day. Right. That cut down greatly on election violence, but it's hardly a democratic measure. So um, as, as we were hearing earlier, the best way to deal with that is, is twofold. One is the deus ex machina that the US and other donor countries can provide if it's an aid dependent country. Mm -hmm. um, when that happens, you can often get uh, people close to the incumbent or people close to the challenger to basically sit the two of them down or the three of them or however many and, um, and have a very uh, tough conversation about dividing up the spoils, um, who's getting what, and what the country stands to lose. Often what you get from that is not a very democratic outcome, but a more peaceful outcome. Mm. Uh, you can choose whether that's more morally appropriate or not. Right. Um, where you don't get a deus ex machina, you can also have um, an independent electoral commission and the more independent, the better. India has a, has a brilliant one, actually. India's electoral commission can disarm people when it thinks that uh, violence mm -hmm. is likely. They can run elections in parts of a state separately so that they can mass mm -hmm. police in one part of a state, move on to another one. It does not fully prevent violence, however, if an incumbent or if a challenger wants to um, instigate their supporters to use violence, uh, that can overcome the best of measures, mm -hmm. but these are things that we know work. Yeah, you know, the um, India, of course, which uh, yeah, every time it conducts an election, it is the, 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 the biggest election in the history of elections, uh, just given the sheer size of numbers. I once uh, did a story on this one town in particular, which had only one eligible voter, and they actually set up a system for that one person to vote. So um, uh, there's a lot of doom and gloom, but also I know a lot of these institutions do, do hard work um, to maintain uh, the act of democracy, the act of elections. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna stay with you um, for one more question. Uh, this one's from Sam Wallenberg. Um, and he asks, uh, to what extent do you think um, polling influences distrust in processes or outcomes? Because, you know, obviously a lot of times polling can be inaccurate, it can build expectation, it can then lead to expectations being dashed. What's your experience of, of how polling has changed how people perceive fairness? That's a fascinating question. Um, what we're finding is that it's getting harder to poll accurately, that um, first of all, the number of people who just refuse to answer or who have numbers on no call lists are very high. The demographics of who gets polled and who answers are different. So older retired people in the United States, for instance, are more often uh, willing to take polls, but that skews the results of polls, cell phones have greatly altered um, who answers. 
And so we're finding the polls to be less and less accurate, less and less demographically true. Also, people um, are often unwilling to admit to a pollster mm. that uh, they want to vote for someone who's perceived as uh, not appropriate to vote for, whether that's an extremist party or, or what have you. So um, I think it's true that polls are getting less accurate. Whether that's building expectation and dashing them, I can't really say. I haven't seen mm. any good research on that. Mm. Um, but it is true that uh, when people feel that there's a gap, now sometimes that gap is real. Sometimes you see polls that are more accurate and then suddenly the election comes out mm. the wrong way and you think, well, well something's wrong there. But mm. um, it certainly does raise the question in people's mind. Of course. I think in general, as people are losing agency, as, as local news diminishes, for instance, and in the United States or as local news hasn't existed in certain other places, as you're, beha- as you're being forced to rely more and more on information that is not apparent to you, you're having to rely on other people, you're more susceptible to being manipulated because right. um, you don't have the agency to make your own choices and make your own uh, judgments. Right. And that's something we have to work towards preventing. It worries me that you say polling is getting worse. Uh, November, let me bring you back in. Uh, There's a question from Alice Taylor, uh, another one of our viewers. Um, The viewer questions, by the way, are just excellent uh, today. Uh, But Alice asks um, about um, the difference between um, mail-in ballots or or ballots that are cast um, through, you know, a technological sort of system. Um, And I want to ask you, Movember, whether there's any difference in sort of trust levels on those two things um, from your observations uh, in elections across Africa or elsewhere. Um, great question uh, from Alex there. The main Alex. issues remain that um, people want to be able to go through a process that they can control. They have a sense like there's a minimum control on their hand. So a ballot that somebody cast and put in, they can see that. That's something that they can say, we saw people vote. The moment, this is the challenge that we have when it comes to any other process, even technology. If people feel like, if the voters feel like there's part of the process that is beyond their control, that becomes problematic, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it was mailed in because they don't have control of seeing what happened. But if it's a combination of you're putting the bill or the paper ballot right into the box. And at the end, there's a machine that tallies the numbers and send it where it needs to go. That builds trust. So the issue of ball- mailing ballots across the continent is still one that is very contentious. And it's contentious because of the reason, some of the reasons that I just mentioned. I'm sure there are many. Because if you don't trust the system, you know, at the beginning, we talked about the electoral process itself. So if you don't trust the electoral commission, if you don't trust where this mail-in ballot will end, then you suppose all the bad case scenarios, right? They will tamper with them, they will stuff them, and so on. So it's not one that a lot of people across the continent embrace. You know, um, Cassandra, to bring you back in, one thing I've been wondering about is, you know, there are elections that um, are secure, um, as we heard from Chris Krebs earlier about, you know, the 2020 U.S. election. There are elections that are clearly not. There are elections that are called into question, and rightly so. Um, they've either been rigged or there were influence, uh, you know, voters were influenced in a certain way or, um, you know, the vote counting was was dodgy. One thing that occurs to me is it's important to distinguish between those two things, between an election that was free and fair and one that wasn't. How do we do a better job of that transparency in sort of calling a spade a spade? Yeah, that's a really great question and pressing right now. Um, You know, this is where the looking to things we've tried in the past, looking also to the potential um, advancements of technology that can help us increase transparency um, is is an interesting intersection where we're at right now, kind of a crossroads of of trying to bring in new tools that could help us, but cautiously until we're sure that they can be used ethically, transparently, and responsibly to increase the trust for all the reasons um, that were just explained. Like that could also introduce a new layer of distrust, right? So, you know, 
looking to limit the time, there are some countries that have very short time frames for turning around and, and um, confirming election results, others that can take a very, very long time. Um, we see different evidence that that process and the length of that process could influence um, the trust. And so are there tools or are there um, aids that we can use to close that gap or to make that more transparent for, for voters? Um, th this is one of the things that could you know, help to contribute to that. Mm. Rachel, um, another sort of academic question in a sense. Um, I'm curious about demographics. Um, you know, uh, do younger people tend to have more or less trust in elections? Is there any data on on how different demographic sort of sections view elections? You know, Cassandra is nodding, so she might know that data better than I. I know that um, young people uh, are, are losing trust in democracy. That's slightly different than losing trust in elections. Yes. But what we're seeing worldwide is um, in established consolidated democracies, young people are showing the lowest levels of trust. And this isn't just that all young people always have low trust and then they get more trust as they get older. They're exhibiting the lowest level of trust compared to other generations at that same age. So mm -hmm. there's something going on with young people now. It's different in parts of Africa in places that have recently not had democracy or where nearby countries have recently not had democracy, the young seem to appreciate it more and to, to respect that system more. It seems to be more uh, prevalent in more consolidated democracies where they mm. frankly don't necessarily know what they have to lose, but have a lot of critiques of the system. that. They sure. Uh, Cassandra, since you were nodding there, I'm going to give you the last word. Tell, uh, tell us what you know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we we do a lot of work at trying to increase youth turnout, but we've also seen that um, young people are engaging in politics and the political process in different ways besides just voting. So there's also a question of how to channel the energy and the you know knowledge and familiarity with the, the political situation in a given country into a process. And this comes back to if they trust the process, they may be willing to also participate in the traditional um, you know, form of voting. But if they don't, then that's where we can sort of channel our efforts and showing that we can use the energy that is coming out in so many different forms on social media, in um, protests, things like that, um, and still get them to engage in the way that democracy has always turned over power, which is through the actual elections. Mm. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, Dr. Cassandra yeah. Emmons, Dr. Rachel Kleinfeld, and Movember Faiso Dizolele. Thank you to the three of you for um, a terrific conversation. I learned a lot from each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure sure. to have you all on. All right, to take us through to the end now, we just have a few minutes left. I'm going to bring in Chad Vickett. He is the Vice President of Global Strategy and Technical Leadership at IFAS, uh, our partner for this event. Uh, Chad has extensive legal and international election administration experience with an emphasis on strengthening democracy and governance in transitioning societies. Chad, welcome. Great. Thank you, Ravi. Chad, so just reflecting on um, the conversations we've had so far, what are we missing? You know, I think we're uh, missing the point. I think Rachel made a very important point about taking agency back. Um, I think it's not just the agency of leaderships within the countries in which we work around the globe, but it's also all of us defending democracy. What's the agency we can take to push back on those that are trying to undermine trust in elections? Mm. And, and how does one take that agency back? You know, I think uh, we've really been focused on, I think since 2016 and before then, the tactics of those that are trying to undermine trust in elections. And I think we as those defending democracy need to have a broader strategy, understanding the drivers of trust, understanding the programs and effective ways we can push back in very specific areas. Of course, every country is different. So we have to understand where there are vulnerabilities, within each country and then design programs and, and ways in which we can affect that change in that country in a specific amount of time. Mm. You know, one of the themes through our discussion over the last hour has been uh, not just a lack of trust in elections and what to do about that, but the larger issue of democratic backsliding. And, you know, it's the two are different, but related. 
Um, the two need to be tackled together, but also separately, right? Yes, I think, um, you know, there has been so much uh, written about corruption and the networks of corruption and the profit that can be had from autocratic government. And I think that's part of what's undermining democracy. There's also, as Chris pointed out, I think it was very good to point out that there is a whole industry of those working to undermine trust in elections. And it's a very profitable industry. We've seen that internationally for a very long time. I know that the US has become very focused on this, uh, but it's been something we've seen uh, for two decades. And so I do think that both the profitability of anti-democratic uh, uh, systems and also uh, you know, in conflict with the way in which those who are trying to buttress democracy I think we have to be able to understand how individual countries fit into that larger system. And just a final beat on, on misinformation campaigns. When you look around the world, do you get the sense that governments uh, are equipped to, to sort of deal with the industry that, that Chris described? No, clearly not. Uh, I do think that uh, when we work around the globe, with election management bodies, courts, and others, uh, people are very concerned and not sure what to do about the issue of disinformation. And I think that gets back to the point about agency. I, we do need to figure out what to do about it. There are ways to uh, confront this issue as we've discussed both individual leaders taking some responsibility, institutions pushing back. I think Kenya, the difference between 2017 and 2022, the way the Kenyan uh, election Commission and the court there handled those issues shows the process and people can help buttress and fight back against this mis disinformation. Chad Vickers, thank you for joining us. Great, thank you. Great to have you on and also thank you to our uh, other speakers who joined us over the course of the hour. Thanks to IFAS, the International Foundation for Electoral Systems uh, for supporting uh, this event. And also thank you to you, our audience around the world, I have to say I do many of these and uh, the questions today from, from all of you around the world um, were just terrific. Um, FP's events don't stop here. Join us this Thursday for a reporter's notebook um, where our team of reporters will look closely at the developments in the war in Ukraine. Uh, and if you missed it, FP had a big presence at the UN General Assembly last week where we covered topics ranging from healthcare to technology to the fallout from Ukraine and multilateralism, go to foreignpolicy.com slash events or foreignpolicy.com slash FP Live to learn more. That's it from me. I'm Ravi Agrawal, FP's Editor-in-Chief. Take care. See you soon.